With a show of hands, how many of you experienced last year's fire season here in southwestern Oregon? <laughs> Chances are many of you experienced the smoke that went with it. Last year we had 300,000 acres on fire on and near the Rogue River Siskiyou National Forest. We welcomed 15,000 firefighters from all over the country and actually from New Zealand and Australia as well to come here to help keep you safe. I spent over $200 million last year making sure that we got these fires out. In the last two years on the Rogue River Siskiyou National Forest, 500,000 acres have burned. So what's changed? Has it always been this way? As an indigenous person who has ancestry in this area, in fact, within the entire Pacific Northwest, I know for a fact that when you remove low intensity prescribed fires from the landscape, you're adding to the fuel problem. The United States Forest Service has been in control of these lands, many of these forests, for over 100 years. In 1910, we experienced some large fire in our country, and it was at that time that wildfire was seen as a negative. So let me ask you, is all fire bad? Is all fire good? There lies the complicated issue. As an indigenous person, you relied on the forests, and we still rely on the forests for many things. It's our grocery store. It's our pharmacy. In fact, holding in my hand is an angelica root that we in Hoopa called Mohachetholin. It's one of our most sacred medicines. We use it in our ceremonies. It's your transportation. Remember, 150 years ago, you didn't have Uber. <laughs> and would you want to walk through the forests, through poison oak and lots of brush, and get ticks all over you? You didn't have a Walmart, so in order to have utensils and things to eat out of, you needed to make your own baskets. I come from a long line of basket weavers, and they will tell you if you want to make a pretty basket, you need good materials. And how do you get good materials? You routinely burn. Low intensity burns. So the art of describing to the public the difference between bad fire, which you can see on the slide, is the Klondike fire from last year. Many of you may have heard of it. When you have a large crown fire like this, everything in its way dies. It gets incinerated. All of the old trees you're trying to protect are furry and feathered friends. More importantly, our watersheds are put in harm's way when you have fires that are unnatural and that burn with this kind of intensity. Not the least of which, they threaten you and the safety and the firefighters that I deploy. It's really, really humbling when you're asking somebody to go do something and there's a really good chance that they're going to get hurt by what you've asked them to do. In the forest service world, we call that mitigating risk. So the key folks to mitigate the risk when we have bad fire, which in my opinion are the fires that are happening in the hottest times of the year, and if you have enough of them across the country, you will run out of firefighters, and you will run out of equipment, including helicopters, bulldozers, hotshot crews. You will run out of them when you simply have too much fire on the landscape at the same time. And when you live in a beautiful area like we do, where you have more trees than people, you will lose out when there's a competition for resources. When a large city is on fire at the same time as us, those resources are going to go where there's more homes and people to protect. 
So that is why you simply can't just let fires burn. Because what we've learned on the Rogue River Siskiyou in the last two years is that fires don't stay in the backcountry. Our fuel type here is more like California than it is with the rest of the Pacific Northwest. The things that we are seeing in California is our reality too. And that's why it takes such an aggressive approach to putting fires out at the time of the year when we don't want to see them. But the key, folks, is to do active management and share that stewardship with our partners. And we have many, many partners that are willing to help us. And with this active management, our goal is to go out and reduce the fuels so that when we do have to deploy a fire team and people out there to keep you safe, we're giving them the best chance to put that fire out and so that they can return home at the end of their shift. With this, it's my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague who will tell you a lot more about what we're doing here locally to do this fuels reduction work. I want to take you back to 2009. It was September 21st. I was sitting in my kitchen eating breakfast, and I looked out the window. And instead of the normal view in the fall, a beautiful fall morning, the trees were bending over sideways from a wind. These are the same winds when we see tragedies happening in California. We hear names like the Diablo and the Santa Ana winds. That's the same kind of wind. A very dry, hot east wind was blowing in Ashland that morning. As I went to work, I talked to the fire chief and I said, wow, this is a really bad day and it hadn't rained in a long time. And so we put some extra restrictions in place that day, telling people not to use machinery that might cause a fire. And I took off to a meeting over in Central Point that was scheduled over at the Department of Forestry. In the middle of that meeting, I could hear the radio traffic in the background and somebody sitting next to me looked at me and said, I bet that's in Ashland. And I thought, no, it's not in Ashland. I could hear the helicopter taking off from the Department of Forestry, and then I heard the word Siskiyou Boulevard. And I knew it was in Ashland. And so I jumped in my truck, and I headed out I-5 back towards Ashland, maybe going a little faster than I was supposed to, but I had the lights on. And the whole time, I could see this plume of smoke growing over the town. And so that was really a worst-case day for us in Ashland. The wind was blowing hard. It was very dry. It hadn't rained in a long time. And now we had a wildfire threatening our town and threatening our watershed, blowing directly at the Ashland Creek watershed, uh, which is primarily managed by the U.S. Forest Service, Merv and his folks. But what happened that day wasn't the worst thing that could have happened. And in fact, it ended up being one of the best things that could have happened. And it wasn't a miracle that that happened. It was actually what we planned to happen. In a world where fires are routinely going to thousands and hundreds of thousands of acres, that fire was put out at 200 acres. We lost one house that day, not hundreds of houses like we see routinely these days. That fire came across this 15-foot wide driveway in the crowns, you saw the previous picture, 200-foot tall flames, and the fire fell to the ground. It slopped over that roadway, and fire crews were able to pick up that fire on the other side, along with helicopters, and a lot of retardant dropped in that day. And that all actually went according to plan. We had worked on that piece of property and a lot of adjacent properties with funding from the Forest Service, Starting in the year 2000 and lasting till 2008, we had crews out on the ground. We made relationships with private landowners. We changed the fuel conditions in places where we thought we would be successful to put the fire out. And it is amazing that it actually does work. And it's not just this fire. It's working on hundreds of fires that are encountering fuel reduction areas that have been created and planned ahead of time it's saving communities, and it's saving natural resources, and it's saving water sources like ours, the Ashland Watershed. 
But this happened outside of the Ashland watershed. The watershed, as you can see in this picture, is integrated with the community. We are one with the forest. The Ashland Creek watershed has critical wildlife habitat. It's the source of our drinking water. Recreation is extremely important. And as a backdrop to the city and our way of life, it's the reason why a lot of people live here in Ashland. It's because it's beautiful and you can walk out your back door onto a trail and enjoy nature right at your doorstep. And in the middle of all that is the Ashland Creek Watershed Reservoir called Reeder Reservoir. This is where 900 million gallons of water is processed every year and delivered to the citizens of Ashland as drinking water. The human body is roughly 60% water. So the water that's coming out of the forest and is draining down into this beautiful reservoir and getting delivered to you becomes part of you. You are part of the forest. And as Merv talked about, that forest for us, it's part of our lives, and we really do need to take care of it. But we really weren't at the time. More than 10 years ago, this is really symbolic of what the shape of the Ashland watershed was like. It was in shambles. Many trees, many, many, too many trees per acre. In fact, three to sometimes 10 or 20 trees, um, 10 times as many trees per acre as is sustainable were growing there causing all kinds of problems with insects and diseases, but also an overwhelming sense of fire danger, and we all knew it was sitting there right behind our city. So what do you do when you have a complex problem like that? Well, we do what Ashland has done many times. We get creative minds together, we gather great professionals, and we put them in a room, and we say, we need a solution to this really complex problem. It's got social dimensions, it's got ecological dimensions, it's got economic dimensions, and certainly as part of our community, it's a threat to the safety of Ashland and the citizens. So in 2004, we came up with a plan called our Community Wildfire Protection Plan, a plan for what to do in our watershed to address the fire and the forest health issues. We handed that plan over to the Forest Service, and they said, you know what? Ashland, Ashland knows something about this stuff, and we like what they said. We are going to actually implement this project. That became known as Ashland Forest Resiliency. We started cutting trees in 2010 in Ashland Forest Resiliency, a project that became known for collaboration and partnership. Now it's a national model for those things, we routinely offer tours to the public. It's a transparent relationship with our community. We have monitoring that goes on to make sure we're doing the things that we said we were gonna do and that we're not having negative effects on the ecosystem. And we've put a lot of boots on the ground with people trained in ecological forestry. There are four partners to this project, the City of Ashland, the US Forest Service, Lomakatsi Restoration Project, and the Nature Conservancy. And we've done a lot of great work. We somehow, through the narrow streets of Ashland, managed to drive 3,500 log trucks full of excess trees, trees that are byproducts of restoring our ecosystem, and we delivered them to local mills. We made $6 million on that that we put back into this project, something called stewardship that allows that money to be returned to the project and to accomplish more work. And now we're at a point where, like Merv talked about, we need to learn to live with fire. We need to put fire back on the landscape, the good kind of fire out there to prevent the bad kind of fire. And we have a long way to go with this. And it's challenging because who, after a summer, of seven weeks of intense smoke wants to experience more smoke in order to get ahead of this problem. We call that the fire wildfire paradox. We actually need more wildfire, good wildfire out there on the land through controlled burning, and we need less of the bad kind of fire. But there's gonna be both for a while. 
This is an example of a day during the summer with thick smoke, the kind that you remember from last summer, the summer before, and some days even before that. This is an example of a busy day of control burning around Ashland. You can actually see the hills behind town. Summer smoke, not so much. Control burn smoke, this lasts a day or two, maybe just a few hours. Summer smoke lasts for weeks on end. Now, it's not a one-for-one -one trade off. We're going to experience both of these things for a while. But as we start getting ahead of this issue, we can expect to see more days like this, even in the summertime. And as we bring our community together, and we bring workers in, and we train them, we can expand this project, because Ashland's watershed is just a postage stamp out there. And we need to engage the entire landscape to the north, to the south, the Rogue River Basin, and there are plans to do just that. And Merv and I are both working on those. And we need your support. We need you to tolerate some smoke, and we need you to ask for support from the leadership in our communities. We need more money to do this work, and we need to prioritize it and move quickly. Because living with wildfire is a challenge, but it's a challenge, I think, that we are up to. With that. So in addition to helping us with the funding, and also making sure that your homes have defensible space around them. We also could use your support in making sure that you support these projects. When they're going through the NEPA process, we have a public comment pro process and a way for you all to get involved. That would be a great way for you to voice your support on some of this work that we're doing so that we don't end up with more bad fire. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.